Good morning and good afternoon to those of you that have joined today's webcast. Uh, my name is Helen Beale and today I'm joined by my colleague Ryan Dobson. Say hello Ryan. Hello everybody. Um, today on this range for webcast we're going to be talking about doing DevOps with the legacy systems. So I imagine all of you that have um, registered have quite a lot of experience um, with your legacy systems. So let's have a quick look at um, what we're going to cover today and um, we're going to look at these um, four main things. So we're going to look at um, what is legacy? What are we talking about when we say this word? Um, why is it a challenge, a specific challenge in the DevOps world that we need to address? Um, what solutions do we have to this specific challenge? And then we're going to look at how Range of Four can help. But let's start by thinking about what is this thing that we call legacy? Um, so good old Wikipedia, we can always rely on them for a good description. Um, I think what we really learn here is like this idea of it being a previous or outdated system. And I think um, something that's really important here that Wikipedia does go on to say later on in the definition, and by the way, this is just the first paragraph, it's quite a long definition, um, is often this legacy system is something that's actually really important to that organisation. It's often a piece of core business um, infrastructure and application that's been running for a long time, that's very critical, perhaps is the thing that underpins everything that the business do. So we call it legacy because it's kind of old. Um, it's probably not architected or built in the way that we would build it now if we knew what we know now. Um, so, you know, that benefit of hindsight and 2020 village, uh, vision even. Um, it says here it's often a pejorative term. Um, so it's kind of this thing, I used to work with a company years ago, Safeway, and they used to refer to their, they used to hate the word legacy. So don't call it legacy, we call it cherished. Um, other people I've heard calling it heritage as well. So um, this idea that it's very important. Um, this last sentence as well, this can also imply that the system is uh, out of date or in need for replacement, apologies uh, there. Um, and this is really the key thing that we're, we're trying to tackle here. What do we do with these systems? But let's explore a little bit more detail why they might be causing us problems. Um, so some examples of these types of systems. Um, we've got some pictures here of various things. So we've got a picture of, a, of an IBM um, System 390 or Z series, so a mainframe. So mainframes are often referred to as legacy. We've got a picture of a can of spaghetti code, which I think that was new to Ryan earlier on today when I talked about that. Um, was that okay? Lo love that metaphor, yeah. The spaghetti code. Yeah, so I'd heard of it before, but we're going to reference a, a really brilliant webcast about loosely coupled systems later on, and they talked about it quite a lot. It came up in their question and answer session at the end. So you know, this idea that <clears throat> over time an application has become more and more complicated you know it could be over decades we work with some customers where their core critical business systems are literally decades old um, and hundreds of thousands of man hours have been put into coding that application um, and the architectures uh, architectures drifted and people have added new things and there's been new integrations and new apis and new bits of the application and we end up with this thing you can kind of see on the bottom right. So that's kind of a visualization of the spaghetti code. So if we try and change one piece of it, it has a lot of unpredictable after effects. So there's lots of dependencies. Um, it's a bit of a mess. We don't know what's going to happen. It's all very unpredictable. And then you can see a couple of other things here. So we have these very old kind of user interfaces and, and old types of uh, coding languages and things that people are dealing with when they're dealing with legacy. And they, in turn, give us a, a problem from a skills perspective. So as we have newer, younger people coming through the education and technical uh, kind of um, education system and learning um, today's techniques, they might not know um, how to write an assembler. Um, but you might have a core business app that's in Assembler or COBOL or something that's equally important, and they may only know Java and Python and .NET. Um, so we kind of need to, to think about what the impact is of working on these um, very old but extremely reliable. I mean, nothing is more reliable than a mainframe, really. These old systems um, with code that has been developed over many, many years. Um, so why is legacy a challenge? Let's have a think about that. We'll go back to the Wikipedia definition here. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of words on this page, right? So I think, Ryan, there was one particular bullet point that I think we really, like, picked out, and it was this system being hard to maintain, improve, and expand. 
Um, when we looked at that, and bearing in mind people on the call that for Angel 4, probably 90% of our customers are people that have been around for quite a while. So they are our enterprises in the UK and the rest of Europe. They're companies that are tens of years old. In some cases, we've got customers who are um, over 100, over 200 years old. Of course, not all of their IT infrastructure is that old, but we have customers that have had their companies running for a very long time. Um, when you look at that sentence, Ryan, bearing in mind the kind of customers we talk to, what does it make you um, think about that you've observed with our uh, the organisations we work with? Yeah, I know a couple of customers come into mind. I mean, like, um, you, you hit the nail on the head, really. You know, this this technology is quite old um, nowadays, to, to say the least. And um, at the end of the day, um, there is a skills skills need still for, for people that actually understand, you know, these old school mainframes and, and legacy systems. The, the only problem at the moment is that, especially with the, the rise and rise of DevOps and all these new funky open source tools and techniques, um, people are not you know taking on um taking on these these sort of legacy skills as such um so we're definitely definitely seeing a um an increase in the in the skills gap um to say the least um and yeah a couple of customers spring to mind not not naming any names but um yeah you know the the experts are nearing retirement um and they are having a bit of a Bit of a crisis on their hands is do they do they invest in um, a sort of quick solution to um, sort of shift the legacy code which we know probably wouldn't work um, or or do they sort of all hands on deck to find somebody that can uh, that can replace these uh, these long-standing colleagues of theirs so yeah definitely a, a major skills gap um, and uh, and not enough people coming through with with this understanding so I think the further we move into this sort of more digital field, um, you know, the, the the moving away from legacy systems is, is just going to have to have to come through. And that's really the point, what you just said there about moving into this digital field. And I feel like the Wikipedia description here has implied this in some of its words, but we need to be more explicit about this. I mean, there is a, a great paper, I haven't actually referenced it in this presentation, but people can call, can look it up. Um, a great report came out from our partner Sonotype recently called The State of the Software Supply Chain. And in it, in one of the first couple of pages, there is a paragraph entitled The Fear of Death. And what we're talking about there is this digital world. And if people don't keep up, they will be outcompeted and they will be disrupted and they will not have a future. And it's, um, I can't remember, was it Forrester or somebody that said, you know, um, you don't have to change, but then you don't have to choose to survive. It's kind of up to you. So the problem with these legacy systems is, yes, they may be incredibly reliable. They may have been there for years. They may be critical business systems. But are they so difficult to change that you are going to be outchanged, if you like, by your competitors, whether they're um, people that have been around as long as you or upstarts into the um into the, the markets, so the kind of fintechs that I know that you're a big fan of. So I think this is the real problem. And that's kind of reflected in the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point. Um, sorry, actually the sixth bullet point where it says um, budgetary constraints often lead corporations to not address the need of replacement or migration of legacy system. And this is the big question around legacy. When you've got a legacy app, do you wholesale pick it up and change it to something else? or other alternatives. Now we have customers, Hiscox is a good example, that had like 14 different systems that were basically um, kind of was their legacy application, if you like, and they just wholesale um, moved to a new platform. That was their DaVinci project. That's the, the project that they've won their various DevOps and continuous delivery awards. But, you know, that is a big question for a lot of organizations. It's a very expensive thing to do. And actually that could be a bit of a business killer if you get it wrong, you know, if you spend so much money and time and effort and does it mean that you have to hire loads of new people and what is the management overhead and getting them up and running what if you can't get them working together there's lots and lots of questions to consider this, this, this is our question right and we, we encounter this all the time it's how do you find money and time to eventually make money and time you know you, uh, there's got to become some point where the the risk outweighs the uh, the cost of, of changing and moving on and that's yeah it's and that's actually such an insight, insight, insightful 
point because that whole thing you just said about finding time to save time, most people we know that can't do that is because they're struggling with masses of technical debt. And that technical debt is normally to do with the legacy system where people have over many, many years have architected things that are costing them more and more and more and they just are firefighting the whole time. And, you know, when we talk about the three ways and we're always like with organisations, do you have time to experiment and learn? And lots of organisations say no. And that's because, A, they're too busy firefighting technical debt. B, they're trying to push through far too much change and they never get a breathing space. So these are the kind of legacy questions people have to ask themselves. Do we stop? Do we throttle change? What do we prioritise? Do we replatform? Do we do something else? Um, and this slide I popped in here because it's it reflects all of that as well. So what we've got in these large um, enterprise organisations, um, they're, they're the rhino on the running machine that's trying to become the unicorn. And it's classic kind of DevOps terminology about we've got these unicorns and these unicorns are, um, you know, fangs, Facebook, Apple, Netflix. Um, Google, all these organizations that were built on the, the internet and are very, very fast at doing stuff. But many, many enterprises are the rhino and that, that weight on the rhino is the technical debt. It is the legacy systems. It is making them slow and it's making it hard for them to change. So the good news is you are not alone. And I think, Ryan, we've kind of already said that, that most of the organizations we work with are tackling legacy challenges mm -hmm. so in a way having a conversation about legacy is kind of pointless because that's what everyone's dealing with you know 38 percent here i think that's low 38 percent but they you know took the time to point out that they've got a mix of legacy and modern applications so this kind of concept of brownfield um you know there's like a building a property development term um, and this is creating complexity in terms of deployment strategies and endpoints and toolchain. That statement annoys me slightly because DevOps is so much more about a deployment strategy, but we're going to talk about that um, in a moment. Was there anything else on there, Ryan, that you thought was worth pointing out? On on that slide? Um, yeah. No, I don't know. It, it, that seems a bit low, 38%, but then it just thought, well, the amount of new companies that can just get you know born every day now on the web, as you said, um, these these unicorns, doesn't really surprise me um but then the you know the large organizations that are you know in your making your millions and billions um these are guys that, that need to keep up and need to address their ways a little bit mm. i think the point about the tool chain sprawl on the right is very interesting there as well because we see that don't we we go in and we'll assess companies and we'll analyze what tools are in there and we'll find literally a bit of everything um, yeah. and different teams doing different things and they're not being any kind of centralized or shared service providing an enterprise architect tool chain and of course this is one of the most controversial and emotional areas of devops where people have their favorites that they want to work with and we see a lot of rows over that but that's it this is one of the things that legacy causes that's it. And I think there's also that sort of internal fight over sort of innovation versus risk, you know, that we see all um, every single day. You know, you can use these new tools and techniques, for example, Docker microservices. Um, some people will view that as for these new fancy toys that maybe not be a, a great solution. Um, whereas others know that, you know, taking the time to invest in, in learning how these uh, applications run and the new way of doing things can um, add the massive investment later on. Oh, sorry, return on investment, should I say? Yeah, totally, the return. Yeah. And I, I think what you just kind of alluded to there as well is this difference of opinion. And I think, you know, some people think, oh, God, that's sort of that, that sort of application, so we can't do anything with that. We can only do DevOps with our web applications. So I've put this slide in because um, it's, a, it's a Gartner slide, and I do love Gartner, and this is Ronnie Colville, who's a great analyst, but... This was some interesting thinking, which has created quite a lot of discussion in the market. So this idea that some applications are better for DevOps than others. So what we're basically saying here is there's these traditional or legacy, if you like, systems of record um, that need a lot of governance and not a lot of change. And therefore, we don't DevOps them. Whereas what we DevOps is systems of innovation where there's less governance and uh, more change. And then we've got the ones in the middle. But I think this was a dangerous thing. And this this thing um, here, this pace layered application strategy, led us to bimodal. And bimodal was a dangerous thing. This is where we say here, this is also where variable speed IT can be applied. This is a slide lifted straight out of our uh, DevOps Foundation course, by the way. Um, and then 
we talk, this is where we talk about variable speed IT. But I wanted to bring up this article here um, called DevOps and Legacy Systems A Mission Impossible because I thought the statement that Aditya came up with here about um, you know, the likes of Gartner and coming up with this um, idea about bimodal IT um, and how that's not as helpful as it could be. Um, and what we should be talking about is variable speed was was very um, pertinent to this discussion. So what part of the statement there is the dependencies across the systems in the enterprise landscape are just too intricate and too tightly coupled to be defined using such a binary logic. Um, and I thought that was really a, a great way of being very incisive about it. There are lots of people out there that have legacy systems that they may not have changed very much for a long time, but they need to now if they're going to compete. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say on that. Um, Ryan, opinions on bimodal? I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I mean, as, yeah, as you said, it, it um, sort of the slide before, um, going from sort of, everyone using DevOps on new innovation, um, but then the the old legacy sort of gets left behind. But there's always that crossover that at some point, you know, the legacy needs to be addressed. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it yeah. doesn't help anyone really, does it? No, and these, these are complicated conversations and, you know, people that think DevOps is a magic bullet that's just gonna immediately fix everything. It's, you know, this isn't an age where we switch something on or press a button and everything's resolved for us. There are lots of complexities and lots of things to consider. Uh, sorry about that. Something just went a bit wrong there. There we go. Um, but there are some solutions. So let's talk through some of the approaches um, or the DevOps approaches specifically around um, legacy. So um, a range of four, when we look at anything through DevOps lenses, we look at it through the organizational lens first, and then we talk about interactions, and then we talk about um, automation and link those three together. So that's what we thought we'd do today as well when we talk about the solutions. So let's start with thinking about the organization. Now, this is the cultural stuff. This is how an organization works together. This is the behaviors that um, we see. So in DevOps, we've already talked about some of the cultural behaviors that we like to see in DevOps. We talked about the third way. Um, and the third way um, of the three ways is all about experimentation and learning. So we want to foster these environments where people are able to innovate through experimentation. They're able to um, experience failure positively. They're um, in a safe environment where failure can happen um, and they are allowed to learn from mistakes. So we, we know there are lots of attributes that we consider to be specifically um, devils. One of the other things that we often say in DevOps is that DevOps isn't one person's job, it's everyone's job. Security is not one person's job, it's everyone's job. And I love this quote, it's from Aditya's article as well. There are legacy, there are no legacy systems, just legacy thinking. Um, and this is really the, this softer cultural stuff that we always talk about in DevOps. It's like, you cannot change the way that someone thinks, but you can change the way that people behave. So we can learn new behavioral routines around things like doing things incrementally and using agile for example um, creating space to tackle technical debt creating space to be more experimental so this is kind of the first thing this is a cultural thing it's common across devops whether you're working with a java application or a COBOL application um, one of the things we've actually observed around legacy systems is that People kind of think, oh, the mainframe guys, the legacy guys, you know, they're a bit old school. They work in a certain way. What we've actually observed in real life is that actually often people that work in these older teams are extremely good at a lot of what you would call DevOps behaviors. So they're used to working very closely in a team. They're very experienced at working closely in a team and being collaborative. They're very good at increasing flow and reducing handoffs and things like that. And the people and what they people really think is that they can't automate because they've got old stuff like cable and stuff. They can't automate. And that's an assumption that lots of people make. Um, Ryan, anything to add there? Uh, no, I think you covered it all quite well. Thank you very much. So um, I thought I'd slot this in. So I was chatting to um, one of our customers yesterday that uh, highlighted um, this, that they have been um, 
given the finalist position in these uh, upcoming DevOps Awards. And what we really wanted to highlight here is that it's actually their mainframe DevOps um, team. Um, and they've done it very fast. I'm um, just going to pop back on that slide. Sorry, I've got my control panel over the slide, so I can't actually read it. But let me change that. We should be able to look at that a bit more closely. There we go. So great news that our mainframe DevOps work this year has been recognised and we are finalists in the 2017 DevOps Industry Awards. Now, this is one of our biggest banks um, here. So you can see um, uh, and Scott Anthony um, is from Lloyds Bank. So if Lloyds Bank can do it, lots of people can do it. And this is their mainframe team um, that has done something very fast. And uh, you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, um, as more about these awards come out. And um, good luck to Lloyds. Hope you get the uh, winning position on that. So even if you've got, you know, an old culture, even though you've got a team of people that have been working a certain way in for quite a while, you might find that they're extremely collaborative already, or they sound, certainly can um, learn new behaviours. But let's think more about these behaviours and the way that we interact with each other and processes that we have. Um, so part of this is about moving from waterfall to agile. So Typically, in the mainframe world, people would have had like three to six month release cycles, um, maybe even longer, very used to doing things in a very um, linear way. So we'll do some architecture, we'll do some design, we'll do some build, do some develop, do some test, and then we'll kind of finally have one big release day where we'll release this massive thing, which we have to do when it's a big application. Um, what we're really trying to do with everything in DevOps is what we call small batch. So we're trying to break everything down into little bits, like on the right. Um, so we're doing things in small development cycles. We're doing things in, in small application cycles. And Ryan, when we were chatting about this this morning, you had a bit of an epiphany about some of your historical reading lately that I think you should share with the listeners. Well, yes, I am a, a bit of a history buff um, these days. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day, just, just from reading reading a book. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm not a techie guy at all. Um, so I always try to put sort of, situations in terms of agile and, and, and devops um, and one thing that really sort of come to mind the other day um reading about the the roman empire and caesar and his uh, and his conquest was uh, how the romans actually used sort of devops processes to to conquer a quarter of the world so um <laughs> just just to go into this a little bit deeper so when uh, when when the Romans started out, they were very much a one main army, one big body um, of people, X amount of thousands. Um, but what they found as they were encountering new um, new armies from across the globe, um, they couldn't quite manoeuvre as well across rough terrain and um, move as quickly as they needed to to uh, sort of address different, different enemies. So um, what they then evolved into was what's called the menopause system. Um, and that later involved again into sort of the, the cohort system that they use. And in essence, what this is, it's a sort of microservices in the way they, they function. So instead of one big body um, army, what they have is uh, individual units, no larger than um, 100 group of, of guys and even smaller, actually goes all the way down to eight, um, a, a team of eight. Um, and what you find is these individual teams, they will live and work and share lives. Um, you know what whilst in the army but then you know when when it comes to a big battle i.e a big project in uh, in it they would all club together um work in it still in their individual groups but overcome the uh, the enemy i.e overcome the uh, the project so it just sort of hit hit home with me in terms of you know i think devops and agile can really be seen in in a lot of everyday things i mean like sport especially as well how Doing little things often really does overcome um, sort of the larger objectives a lot more easier, a lot more simply, um, and and you can adapt a lot more quickly as well, which I think is is more important nowadays. You know, people haven't got the time to um, you know work on a six month or twelve month waterfall project because by the time twelve months has gone by, there's more technology in the markets and their closest competitor is uh, is ten times ahead. So. The ability to change things as quickly as possible, to readdress things as quickly as possible, um, you know, plays a, a major effect in in um, 
you know everyday life but most importantly it as well so yeah that was my little history history moment um, which, I we, which i love <laughs> yeah it's like we're learning from the romans still but yeah adaptability absolutely key the little and often making everything a habit so make you know making a, the release process like breathing for example instead of having this incredible drama around stopping for a release weekend and there's no reason why we can't take these um, practices and apply them to the mainframe or legacy environment we need to just figure out how to do it you mentioned microservices now we're going to come to that in a minute but this little and often um, continuous feedback continuous experimentation is really important so let's get on to automation um, so I've included uh, a, a case study here um, from Ticketmaster um, and what Justin's really talking about here is what uh, Ryan was just saying really which is kind of this erosion of uh, large monolithic applications uh, using microservices so adding APIs to just gently call it scratch away at the surface of this large monolithic application and pull out bits and make them available in a different way. Um, and that, Ticketmaster said, is that's their, their driver for DevOps. Um, and really, we're going to look at it, microservices again in a minute, but um, it was DevOps Ticketmaster absolutely highlight that enabled them to change their legacy systems and make things more modern and make things more flexible. Um, and other things they got from that was they were able to speed um, their value to market. So they were able to get things to their customer quicker. They were able to become much more focused on the outcome and the business value rather than the kind of technical input of the system. Um, part of what they did there was part of what we were just looking at in Agile. So this idea of distributing authority and allowing greater autonomy um, in these individual teams, just like Ryan just um, described in the Roman army. Um, and this reduction of friction. So um, stopping constraints, stopping handoffs by allowing things like uh, self-service. So um, I also wanted to refer to this uh, relatively new paper that you can download from the Puppet website and the, the links are all in the slides, which you'll be able to um, access after this session. Um, but this is the second myth that Puppet um, identifies, that there's no significant return on investment to applying DevOps principles to legacy apps, and they absolutely um, dispute this. Uh, what they say is that you might think that DevOps is useless for legacy apps. No amount of attention and care can make them healthy again. On the contrary, a healthy dose of DevOps can revive your le legacy apps and transform them into thriving productivity-driving superstars, or in the very least, alleviate the pain they cause so you can get back to driving business initiatives. So Puppet again supporting this idea that we can do things with our legacy apps that will um, make change and make life better using DevOps principles. Now I'm hoping this slide's going to behave itself because it was, ah oh, yes it has, earlier on it was being a bit of a pain. Um, but here's another case study for you here, this is Walmart, a very large US retailer, um, and they had this vast legacy infrastructure um, and it was taking an enormous amount of time um, to make any changes, basically, um, which was stopping them really achieve their long term, more strategic IT goals. And they used Puppet um, in their large legacy brownfield environment. And, you know, Ryan made a reference earlier on about these new technologies, these open source technologies that, you know, these legacy people won't know about. Um, but this is these new open source technologies being used with these legacy systems. So it's not like you need an entirely different tool set. You can use things like Puppet that you may well be using already for your Java and .NET environments. You can see at the bottom here, it says Puppet. Um, without Puppet, it used to take um, sometimes between four weeks to never to achieve major changes. Now this change is happening a week or a couple of days or sometimes just a couple of hours. So, um, I wanted to highlight this webcast to you as well. Um, again, it's fairly recently, recent webcast, a couple of weeks old, um, from Jess Humble and the guys at Electric Cloud. Um, and it took, it's called Get Loose, Microservices and Loosely Coupled Architecture. And it will give you an hour of quite in-depth technical detail about how to use uh, microservices to um, break up, or I love the word um, that they were using in the webcast, erode your monolithic apps so it's kind of taking us right back to the start of this uh, presentation or discussion 
where we were talking about the specific challenges with legacy apps and whether you go, oh my goodness, we've got this huge monolithic thing that we can never change and we're going to die if we don't change it. So let's just rip out the whole thing and start again. But we've spent hundreds of thousands of millions of pounds and man hours on this thing. Can we just rip it out and start again? Is that a good thing to do? Will we not cripple our business if we go down that path? So what we're really saying um, with microservices and these this approach using APIs is that we can erode the application. So I keep on trying to use this analogy and I haven't quite kind of got it right yet, although I think, Ryan, when I explained it to you the other day, you did kind of get it. You know, like when you see a sci-fi program and they're trying to transport a person from one machine to another machine and they kind of break it up into little bits and then it reforms underneath the other machine. It's a bit like that. So it's not like switching one big thing off and starting another thing off over here. It's like we break it up into bits and it gradually rebuilds over time. Did that work that time, do you think, Ryan? It did. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory definitely uh, springs to mind with uh, what's his name? the TV dude. Oh, yeah, I know the one you mean. I'm going to have to look that up and see if I can find a clip to use another day. But yes, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, monolithic apps can be good, can be bad. Um, generally, um, you know, it says it can be easier to develop, can be easier to test, can be easier to deploy. But only if you do the whole thing. And what if the whole thing is enormous? Um, you know, things then in terms of development and testing and deployment take um, a long time. So, yeah, highly recommend that. And this is just um, summarising again what we were talking about when we talked about the Roman army. And I'm going to keep on using um, that analogy because I think it really helps it stick. It's we're talking about small batch. So, you know, on the left, and this is massively simplified, but, you know, on the left, we've got uh, bunches of DLLs. And then on the right, we've got containers with microservices in it. So we can just, if we want to just test um, that one small bit, we can do that. If we want to just uh, make a change to that one small bit, we can do that because we've got the APIs written in it already. If we want to just deploy that one small bit, we can do that. So it can happen in minutes or even seconds instead of taking weeks and weeks and weeks. So, you know, from a technical point of view, uh, containers and uh, microservices really underpin all that. And then we just had to think about, um, you know, the A in CALMS. Um, so CALMS, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is the very useful elevator acronym to describe what DevOps is all about, originally coined by John Willis, and then uh, Jess Humble added the L for Lean. So this is a, us thinking about the automation element. And, you know, there are some tools that are specifically developed for mainframe type applications. So Smart there, CA's got quite a few. Imagine IBM's got a few. Zact is a specific uh, mainframe set of tools from Denmark. But when we talk to our customers about what tools they're using with their mainframes, we see a tool chain that we could see across Java or .NET or Python or any coding language. It includes Puppet, often includes Jenkins or Git or Bitbucket or Bamboo. It, most people have Jira, and there's no reason why you can't um, manage your requirements for a legacy application using Jira. Why can't you manage your issues using Jira? Why can't you use Confluence? So these, what we're trying to say here is these new t new tools are not exclusive for new applications. Um, and really, I think what we're kind of leading to here is legacy is a bit of a misnomer. You shouldn't really get too hung up about it. Yes, it has some unique challenges around skill. We need to address culture. Um, we need to think about whether um, people are working in agile manner. But this is not different from any of the other DevOps discussions we're having. Um, so thinking about how we can help, um, we did a quick summary um, here of today's talk, really, um, from the OIA perspective. So kind of key takeaways is like from an organization perspective, what we're saying in DevOps is we want it to be experimental. We want people to be collaborative. We want a blame free environment. We want authority distributed so that we have autonomy and mastery and purpose and that people work in self-organizing teams and are able to choose how to do the work we do. None of that is exclusive to legacy or new applications. Um, similarly, with interactions, we want you to be agile. We want things in small batch. We want people to test early and think about testing early and think about engineering, quality, performance, security in everything they do. We want people to think lean. So focus on flow. Figure out where the constraint is. Um, figure out how to uh, get rid of handoffs. Figure out how to... Um, make things go faster and be more complete and accurate as they go through um, a chain of people. And then from the automation perspective, we're thinking about how to architect systems. We're thinking about how to um, 
use things like microservices to make things more small batch. Everything here is about small batch incremental change. Um, some people talk about automate everything. In DevOps, we don't say automate everything. We say um, automate what's rote, um, so the things that you are repeating that are highly manual um, that are happening over and over again. Um, so how can we help? Um, Ryan, would you like to talk us through this at a high level and then pass back to me if you want me to fill out any detail on it? Yeah, sure. I am. Um, so I was at Ranger Four. We talk about um, DevOps evolution in three E's, as uh, as explains there. You just sorry, you just clicked off the slide. But the, the first one's um, explore. So before we start anything, um, and before you start anything in in life, really, you really need to understand exactly where you are. Where are you starting? Where do you need to get to? Um, so our explore. So what what includes in there is. Um, set of DevOps workshops and um, DevOps and Agile workshops. We've done a lot of lunch and learns, um, especially with large enterprise customers. Um, but we, we use Explore as a way to really identify what your current state is. Where is it that you're starting? Where is it that you're currently going wrong? But more importantly, what can you focus on that will give you the biggest business value, biggest business impact? That if should you improve that first, it's going to you know, pay pay dividends um, sort of straight away. So explore for us is really where do you start, what do you need to do, and producing roadmaps. So um, DevOps maturity assessment, very popular we do with a lot of uh, enterprise customers and also small customers, not worth uh, leaving anyone out. Um, workshops um, and also value stream mapping. Um, how how do you look, how do you um, look at current value streams um, Bring in, I mean, like for an example, we, we worked with a, a, a large customer. Current value stream was, uh, was it 280 odd days or 380 odd days, um, which we managed to leanify down to 80 odd days. So, how do you remove waste? How do you identify bottlenecks? Um, educate really is all about learning and improving from within. So, Ranger 4 at Ranger 4, we're not a consultancy that will come on site and take over a project for six months and hand back we're really all about um growing as a business internally evolving as a business internally so um range of four we are part of the devops institute helen actually sits on the board of regents so um basically what that means is that helen's responsible um for the um input and uh, sort of the, the knowledge held within a lot of the DevOps and Agile courses that you can see today. Um, these range from DevOps, the DevOps Foundation course, DevOps Test Engineer course we now have, the DevOps Leader, um, Agile Service Management, Agile Process Owner, um, DevSecOps as well now we have. Um, so that, that's all about how do we train up our, our employees to, to get the best out of what we've got. And finally, Evolve. Um, so Evolve is sort of an extension onto explore and educate so once we know exactly where you are um, and where you need to get to how do we get there so part of a DevOps maturity assessment for example um, we will work with organizations to develop a, a roadmap whether that might be over 12 18 24 months um, and how do we go about measuring success over that time um, looking at various um lines of business for example various um sort of areas within in the organization that we can really help to change um helen you, you might want to take over on the evolve part i think you might be better explaining that one yeah i mean you mentioned value stream mapping um in the context to explore that's a really big one for evolve as well in terms of um building out an evolution plan but um it, I think that the important thing to for us is we've kind of stopped describing DevOps as a transformational thing and more of an evolutionary thing. So um, every organization is similar, but every organization has like what I used to like to call its own fingerprint. So when we're doing uh, assessments and things, we look through the OIA lenses that we described, so the organization interactions and automation lens, and we'll see common things. So for example, a really common pattern is that people have started Agile, they're trying to use Scrum, but they've got a number of fails and typical fails will be things like 
Um, they haven't got enough commitment from the business to have full-time product owners, and they're doing things like what people often call product owner by proxy. So they've got BAs acting as product owners, um, or they might have a product back- backlog that's not very visible. Or they might have um, a shortage of untrained, or sh- sorry, a shortage of well-trained scrum masters. Um, they may have done things like merge their scrum reviews or their sprint reviews and the sprint retrospectives and now forget have forgotten to do retrospectives, so they're not doing continuous improvement. So there are lots of things that over time we need to evolve people, and that um, involves lots of different behavioural changes. So it could be that we need to coach people on how to do Agile better, or it could be coaching around ITSM, it could be doing some work around safety cultures, it could be using one of the courses that we just described in the Educate part. So it could be that um, security is a big issue and they've got a massive bottleneck around one or two security experts that are completely maxed out. So there's lots of pieces in the uh, Evolve portfolio. So um, while you were doing that for us, thanks, Ryan, um, a few questions came through. So uh, the first one is, uh, what course would you recommend to somebody dealing with legacy systems? So do you want to answer that one, Ryan? Yes, and I would probably suggest the Agile Service Management. I think you I don't know if you, you would agree with that. On the basis of you think that somebody dealing with legacy systems is coming out of ops? Well, yes, and it's also, I think, yeah, is is probably the main point um, that I'm making on that because it is is how do you how do the operations guys go about um, involving themselves into a much more agile way of working, um, which not only can relate to them being involved in sort of scrum teams, but how do they address you know agile ways of working within their own teams as well? Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that would be a useful one for definitely people coming from the ops side. I do think the foundation course, though, is where everyone needs to to start. And it doesn't matter, like we said today, legacy, schmegacy a little bit. It's just um, principles and ways of working to do things better. And and legacy does not mean you can't do DevOps. Um, In fact, quite the opposite. Sometimes it means that the people working with the legacy system already have quite a lot of DevOps attributes, particularly from... Um, a cultural perspective. Uh, the second and last question that we had today is how long does a DevOps assessment take? Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, we've got um, a sort of two-pronged approach, if you will. So we have an enterprise um, level assessment, which is very wide reaching, um, which is done in a, in a matter of um, sort of a few hours. Um, it's a series of questions and uh, surveys that will basically um, uh, way to explain it um it's based on the state of the devops um state of devops report um and data is analyzed in such a way that it will give you a um a set of graphs which will show exactly where um sort of areas need to be improving what areas you should be focusing on um and we also have the sort of physical um physical side of the assessment which will take um sort of well, pretty much four days, um, four days, if not a couple of more, depending on the size of the business and areas that we're covering. Um, and the, the physical assessment is very conversational, very personal. Um, so we are we are on site um, for a few days for this, as I said, um, sort of two to four in total actually on site, um, where we are meeting and greeting um, people in their day-to-day lives, um, understanding from them on a personal level exactly why, how the business is operating, where we can see improvements and um, how to go about um, actually doing the improvements as well. So, Fabulous. summary, about four, four, four days to, I, I'd say, a week maximum. Yeah, I would say around that as well, depending on the, the extent. So that brings us nicely, I think, to our, the end of our allocated time today. So thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you, everybody, for attending um, today. And uh, we'll be following up with you guys soon. Thank you. Bye for now. See you.